Hi, everybody. I am Jeanette Nyden. This is Is Contract Drafting a Creative Writing Assignment video. For those of you who have emailed me or responded in LinkedIn, thank you so much. We've had some really robust conversations in LinkedIn with respect to some of my other videos. Um, I will be presenting the compilation of those comments as a video in and of itself when we're done with that conversation. I still have one more email to digest a conversation to have. So thank you. All right. Is contract drafting a creative writing assignment? No, it is not a creative writing assignment. They need to be boring, precise, concise, and exact. That is not creative writing. Okay. So why am I talking to you about this? Like who cares? I care a lot. I'm personally very deeply emotionally invested in contract drafting, which is why my clients hire me because I'm emotionally invested in their success. Um, but aside from my irritation and annoyance, there are some really good reasons why we want to be super careful. So I want to talk about an example that happened with a client of mine. Um, this was an account manager who's an older gentleman who'd been in the industry for a very long time, much longer than me, much, much longer than the, the man that I was co-negotiating the deal with. But it was a significant deal. I mean, it was a, probably worth about $100 million, 15-year contract duration if it um, completed the full arc that we had intended. It, it was non-core uh, services um, to my client, but still strategically incredibly important to my client. So big deal. Um, and when he got a chance to get into the contract, he liked to use different words that meant different things. And so that was a really big problem. So all of a sudden we get some contract changes back and the words were different. Um, he didn't properly define the terms and he not even used the same of his own terms throughout the agreement. Um, we had some discussions about um, indemnification around hazardous materials, which was an important thing. There were some chemicals that were brought on to the site in California, and if they spilled, um, what would happen? And we were trying to figure that out. And he wrote a very flowery paragraph as a result of our conversation, which only made things worse as it moved up the food chain, as my client was not in a position to be able to approve that quote unquote flowery language. And it, there was language that the gentleman inserted that conflicted with 4.5 and 20 in the general conditions and 18 in the special conditions and was not aligned to what was in the technical specifications. Um, so there were there were problems with this idea that I can take these random thoughts from these negotiations and I just have license to start putting them into the contract. And so I want to this now that we've set out the problem, I want to establish the goal, which is all contract professionals goal is to have an agreement that reflects the intention of the relationship, which is what this gentleman was sincerely trying to do. He was sincerely trying to reflect the intentions of the relationship. And simultaneously, our goal as contract professionals is that we have to have a document that is very clear, very precise, very exact. And that that clarity and that precision, exactness, those things help when that contract has to be a referee for a dispute later on, which has happened many times because I've been doing this for such a long time. I have negotiated the agreement and then been called back in to um, have discussions around the interpretation of the language of the agreement many years later. And it's very important that you feel confident in the words that you use. So here's some advice. I've got one, two, three, four pieces of advice for you. Pick a word any word or a phrase and stick with it, please. So one of the concerns that I had was the gentleman brought to our attention that we hadn't properly defined supplier owned equipment, which was a really important piece of their service. They were going to be bringing equipment on that was their own consumables. We had properly defined my client's equipment. We had properly defined, but we didn't recognize when we were designing the RFP that they would the supplier would be bringing its own equipment on. So that was a huge miss in some respects. And I was really grateful that for that catch, but then pick a word, any word, and then do it properly. So rather than putting it into a paragraph that I have to figure out and find when I go through with my fine tooth comb, you go into the defined terms, you make a capital, you put the definition, even if that definition is as simple as, as defined in XYZ paragraph, and then you go through the agreement and you find places where it would be appropriate to use that term to bring clarity. Now I did those things and the technical team on my client's side 
was incredibly grateful that we had defined it, was incredibly grateful that the supplier had pointed out that that was a miss on our part in the technical specifications. It clarified pricing. It clarified termination for convenience. What would they have access to if they were to come back onto the property? Well, they, they could have access to the parts of the property where their supplier-owned equipment was. So it was a very big deal to have that clarity, which is do it properly. Two, use tables to explain pricing, scoring, reports, reporting structures. Um, so this gentleman was enamored with asterisks. Okay, so now you can really tell, I'm sorry, get on my high horse. Like seriously, asterisks. This is a $100 million deal. And we've got asterisks, one, two, three asterisks, one, two asterisks, one asterisk, five asterisks. Oh, and then by the way, there's four asterisks with the definition, but I couldn't find anywhere in, it was about 75 pages where that asterisk was actually used anywhere, but the definition was in there. Okay, so not cool in my world. And because it was the pricing model and because it, it also dealt with the termination for convenience um, aspects of how we were going to pay out upon an early termination because they had some upfront investments. Asterisks are just not cool. Like, let's get a table, let's figure it out and let's make it really clear and let's also do some math. So the other um, piece of advice that I have in contract writing is, is we were banding about larger assumptions that were underlining the fixed fee to try to determine how we were going to mathematically determine an early cancellation because there were significant investments up front that the supplier was making. And they had amortized it over 15 years, but what if we want it out at 10, right? Strategic shift in the market, we want it out. We needed to be able to figure that out. That's a formula. And what we had done is we'd gone through and created the underlying assumptions for it, but then those assumptions ended up in the contract and it's like, well, that's part of the solution, but then the formula needs to be the other part of the solution. What is A plus B? And then what is B plus C? What is that? Minus D, what is that? Equals X number. And because we're talking about something that's not likely going to happen, but there's always that possibility that it could happen. And we're also talking about it happening probably several years away where many of the players that are currently negotiating this agreement are currently are the technical support, the SMEs, we're not gonna be around to figure it out. So the contract then in that case acts as a referee. What's the formula if we were to come to the place where we needed to actually do this? Termination for convenience, cancel the contract. And then finally, Use subparagraphs. This is also a call out to my legal colleagues, like WTF, what's going on with these runoff pair, run on paragraphs that go on for like three quarters of a page? Like, have we not heard of subsections? This is a really big deal in very complicated parts of the contract. And so because indemnity limitations of liability were huge in this because of the hazardous materials, chemicals that they needed to bring onto my client's site in California, so not an easily regulated environment to work within and oceanfront property and, 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 right? These were complicated paragraphs and yet the legal team on my client side was sort of enamored with these, you know, 40 word sentences and four and five sentences that took up half of a page. And it was very hard for us when we needed to go in and start making some changes to be able to understand how it all fit together. And so one of the things that you know, I really like to do is use sentences and subparagraphs to really identify what conditions are. So condition A, condition B, condition C. And it just makes it easier for us if we had to narrow in on condition B, we could really figure out how that fit in. We were having a very difficult time doing it the way it was written because it was a big paragraph with a lot of words and provided however that and unless otherwise noted and notwithstanding the foregoing and all the other stuff that members of my tribe do, um, not cool. Like, let's figure out a very simplified way to be able to communicate it that is still concise and precise and exacting, which is why, for those of you, I'm bringing in Melva Finnegan to talk about creating a controlled language or simplified English for an October continuing legal education. Here in Seattle, check out this box here if you want to know more information. Okay, and I want to say, um, so those are my four pieces of advice and a call out to the CH2M Hill contracting person dealt with about two years ago. 
because they did the opposite of this particular situation. And so I don't know who that person is. I never got a chance to actually speak to them. I just saw their edits, but I was incredibly impressed. It was um, a three and a half page audit rights addendum to, I believe the specific conditions of a particular contract. And it was a new exhibit. My client um, was not familiar with it. The legal department had removed the existing audit rights, replaced it with the new audit rights, and it went from three paragraphs to three pages or something thereabouts. And CH2M Hill, their contracting team on the sales side, made about six or seven strategic edits, a few deletions and a few insertions. And when I read it, they changed the intention of the document with very minimal scalpel like precision. That's actually easier to cope with than random florid language that the account manager in my more recent negotiation put into the indemnification for hazardous materials, which caused the big boss to call me and say, what are your remembrances of this? Because my colleague was on vacation and was um, unable to be reached. It was at the airport or something. And so he called me because he's got the other big cheese from the supplier on the phone and neither of them can understand what that language is. Everyone understood what CHML2 was doing um, with the audit rights. And as it turned out, the legal department agreed with many of their edits, I think like six out of the seven or five out of the six, they were substantial, they were warranted, they were supportable, and they were minimal, uh, but impactful. And so that's a really fantastic way to edit and redline and negotiate a document. So is contract drafting a creative writing assignment? I hope that you are equally as convinced as I am. It is not. We aim for boredom. We aim for precision. We, act, we aim for exactness. We aim for completeness. And the contract is a referee when a dispute arises or a misunderstanding or a need for clarification arises. So with that, let me know what you think. Email me. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to work with you if you'd like me to come in and help you negotiate a deal or you'd like any training. Take care.